Good evening, welcome to the dotted lines. Uh, this is the third dotted lines of the Night of Philosophy. My name is Renate Schepen. Um, I explained about the concept before, but uh, because there are all the time different people, so I'm sorry if you heard the st story for the third time, but uh, I will explain a little bit um, the concept of the dotted lines. Because when I saw the theme of the Nacht van de Filosofie, the Night of Philosophy, is over the grens, crossing borders, so it, like, it would also be interesting to reflect on the concept of borders itself. And then uh, the book Thought as a System by David Bohm came to mind. And he is saying the problem, why we have so much confusion in our thoughts, one of the problems is at least, that we confuse solid and dotted lines. So many of the things that we actually think are borders and solid lines are actually dotted lines. And that results in the fact that we think things are divided that are actually connected. So this inspired me to um, create a program, Dotted Lines, and each time invite people that I know are willing to challenge their own ideas and their own ways of looking at the world, and to see if they could maybe discover that the discipline they are in is actually, in a way, also a dotted line. So um, for this third part I have found uh, Isa Mert and Martijn Arts and um, they will explore the concept of technology and nature and politics and uh, maybe I should say everybody who participates in this dotted lines concept they didn't know each other before so they only met everybody only met a month ago something like that I think and actually in their case they only met once and most of the contact and the communication, the encounters went digitally and maybe that's also logically, uh, logical if uh, it's about technology and nature. But they had long email conversations at least. And Isa Mert, she is a teacher at the Vrije Universiteit. She's a political philosopher and um, she lived in various countries. I was thinking, oh, it's a long list. <laughs> I thought it was like... I think in Japan, Turkey, the Netherlands, Germany, uh, the, uh, the United States. And uh, in a way, her concept very much fits with the concept of uh, David Bohm, because she's also looking at the way we're, in a way, uh, creating a fragmented reality, and in which way could we tell a more complete story. And Martijn Arts, he is uh, director of Total Active Media, and he is a designer and engineer, and also. Uh, as a designer and engineer, he is writing a philosophical book about the evolution of technology. So tonight we will explore together the concept of technology, nature and politics. Well, good evening. Um, we actually, <laughs> it's a first for me actually. So um, we will have a dialogue one of the oldest uh, philosoph philosophical ways and I am pretty nervous actually. Now I normally do quite some presentations but I have never been so philosophical as this night. <laughs> so and I actually have to wrote it down so uh, sorry for me looking at my papers and once in a while. So actually my name is Martijn Arts. I was actually born in Ophuizde and I was raised in Wageningen by my father who is an engineer and my mother who is a nurse. And since I was a little kid, I, I had always a curious interest in drawing, learning and subjects like math and physics and biology. And uh, bio the biology was the only subject actually I dropped because I didn't like the teacher. Uh, but I studied industrial design engineering in Delft, uh, University of Technology. So I actually combined technology and design and founded an internet company which I raised to be big and then I got a shareholder of Total Identity which is one of the biggest creative agencies in Holland and it was actually founded itself in 1963 by Wim Cowell. And the funny thing is Wim Cowell founded both my study as well as my uh, agency. So uh, actually I'm home again. So industrial design engineering and Total Identity feels like home and that feels like what I was supposed to do. Um, I'm typical Dutch, by nature and nurture. I believe in makeability. They call me a kleikont because I was actually raised in Wageningen. 
Um, and I'm just Descartian, so actually I'm very much in my head. I'm a rational person. But I'm also quite sensitive and insecure. Uh, I just hate arguments, as a typical Dutch. I'm a designer, and therefore I see a dialectical relationship between ratio and intuition, technology and beauty, um, and grids and freeform. And I'm always in dialogue with myself to shape my ideas. Um, and uh, also with others, actually and try to reach consensus with my ideas and with others. Uh, I'm not aiming for a disagreement, but I like to make small steps in forward thinking and understanding and constructing. And I'm more in touch with the future and the past than actually in the now. So uh, related to this, I'm part of the board of, the, uh, the board of Batavia Land, which is a heritage institution. It's a Nieuwland Air Food Center, Rijksdienst Cultural Air Food and uh, Batavia Air Food. And the goal of this Batavia land is to be a heritage park about polders and dikes, ships and trade, uh, engineering and design. And it's built around the theme of living on the border of water and land. Uh, in my view, everything in the Netherlands is actually designed and engineered, even nature itself. And I love to learn, by the way. I love gathering knowledge and understanding things. And I'm always in wonder and curious about new things. Um, I believe in the that the process of learning and knowing and understanding is similar to creating mental models, uh, which lead to understanding. I think creating models to put to use uh, is, and to construct something new, even mental things, is called technology. Uh, technology is therefore not only the hammer and nails, um, the cars and computers or the software on it. Technology is our mental capacity that creates models and structures, like language, uh, which gave us the ability to learn and communicate. Technology is that what makes us human. It is the underlying principle that enabled our self-consciousness and also our co cumulative con culture. And I do want to make a big disclaimer now, actually, because I'm really not a philosopher. I might sound like one tonight, but um, I really feel more like an engineer and a designer and an entrepreneur. But I do philosophize quite a lot. Uh, I'm reading most books about evolution and technology, mostly related actually to philosophy. Um, and I'm in the process of writing a book about the Zen of technology. So actually what I found out is that technology has the same, takes the same steps as evolution, biological uh, evolution. So the, 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 it's, it's different than biomimicry, which is also a technical term. Uh, it, it's used actually to say that humans try to mimic biology. It's, it's different. It's, uh, it seems that humans are actually reconstructing our own self-image. It's the way we view ourselves. We reinvent ourselves through technology. So that's actually our mirror. Um, so technology, I think, is the, is, it reflects the way we understand ourselves. And technology is then the mirror in which we look. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Martijn. Mirror, mirror on the shore. Um, I grew up in Istanbul, unlike my time, and around the psychologist, mother, historian, father, and a whole family of teachers. My family was rather matriarchal, and always telling me I could do whatever I want. Uh, but in the 80s, in Turkey, it was already a very polarized society. <clears throat> While well, I belonged with a lucky majority of the urban middle class, some families systematically restricted the lives and the dreams of their daughters, really. This very fragmented reality confused me as a child. And I searched for meaning elsewhere, in the stories and in the paintings, and they have always been a part of my life ever since. I spent hours reading Greek mythology and looking at paintings of these themes. I also loved seascapes. Uh, which brought me to Dutch painters, really. And we spent the whole summer on the beach, and I loved the shore. Dutch artists, for me, were painting the sea in, in a way I have never seen it before, in so many colors and in so different lights that it amused me. And it also resonated to a great extent with my questions uh, regarding different perspectives in life. In time, I saw that these different realities compete uh, for support and legitimacy in society. So friction and conflict for me was a regular part of life. 
There is an ongoing ideological war of positions in society I grew up in and to me, in a sense, everything was political. Particularly what we called nature, what we called progress, what we as a society allowed um, to be changed and transformed, whereas others we regard as natural and unchangeable. I didn't like the idea of consensus much. <laughs> It was my life and I wasn't negotiating what I can or cannot aspire to. It was very um, awkward for me to even imagine that, but I was happy to ar argue it through and quite passionately too. So my nickname at high school was The Opposition. <laughs> I always questioned the question. So maybe this is why I studied politics. and. Uh, or maybe it is just that I want to experience these different realities to see how they overcome their conflicts as I first moved to Japan then to Europe etc but there was one conflict that no one talked about and I had to write about that particular story the story of how this little blue green planet was divided into nation states to north and south and divided really into a hierarchy of what technology is produced and what technology is imported and in I had to tell this story in the academia for more or less for financial reasons uh, but also because uh, scientific writing was challenging for me uh, it left the story out while claiming reality people were called poor or backwards without explaining who or what impoverished them or species were called extinct without telling how their living spaces were pillaged or destroyed. So I wondered in two master's thesis and a PhD how the story could be told in a more complete fashion without leaving the history, the politics and the fantasy out. So for that little child that was walking around the beaches of the Mediterranean, dividing the world into different nations was silly and Borders made definitely no sense, except the shoreline. The shoreline made sense because it kept changing. And just like water, water, I thought, ideas, people, technologies seep into our lives, whether we like it or not. And in fact, in this sense, as Anata said, all borders can be regarded as dotted lines. And where I come from, and I think most Mediterranean people like their nature untouched, unnegotiable, um, and quite unconstructed. So my younger self understood nature as wilderness. No dikes, no highways, no skyscrapers in that imagery whatsoever. And as Turkey transformed into a liberal economy in the 1980s, it was not for us, the citizens, to decide which technologies seeped into these borders, into our lives. After all, the leaders of the rather bloody 1980 coup told us technology was good for the economy. How could we not desire the goods that were so easily obtainable in New York, Amsterdam or Paris? The freedom we could aspire to was a freedom to go in, into debt and to consume more. So long as we didn't use those gadgets to tell our stories and what their military technology did to our autonomous life spaces, it was okay. And I did love my new Walkman. I loved listening to music wherever I went to, but as I walked to the, to the shorelines of my favorite sea, it reflected less and less of me. <coughs> its waters got dirtier and murkier as more insecticides and pesticides found its way more detergent and wastewater seeped into its clear turquoise mirror. Nobody asked me, or the Mediterranean, how we felt about such technologies. So I became deeply skeptical about technology, while also being rather dependent on it. What was the border, I wondered, that divides the technology that saves lives from the technology that bombed and raped and broke and impoverished, stained and destructed, without any questions asked. As I moved to Japan 55 years after a certain technology was wiping out 130,000 people at once, this question has become very central to my thoughts and my stories.
poor. <laughs> Technology was dropped on top of 130,000 people. What can you say about that? Um, well, yeah. Humans did quite some nasty things with technology, more than enough to even become skeptical. Uh, but I'm an optimistic. Uh, I, I'm an optimist, sorry. Uh, I think technology can do great things too. And I even think that the same technology that causes the nasty consequences can also provide solutions. Uh, technology can help humans and learn and grow. And it's not technology actually that dropped the bomb, it were humans doing politics. Uh, there you have it. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> Gotta do that. Introduction are done. Positions are set. Now. Uh, I would like to start uh, to furthermore the, uh, and, and extrapolate on this dialogue by defining what I think technology is and meant in the past, what technology means now and what it can mean in the future. Um, like back in the days, uh, uh, humans saw technology in a simple manner. And many of us still do. I regret. Like, Technology is about hammers and axes, arrows and so forth. Uh, technological ar artifacts made it possible to ex extend our lives and our bodies, so our functions to make it more long, powerful, uh, reach more. Um, and later we invented machines and engines. And that gave us the possibility to even produce tools. It was about production, about transportation. And that technology made us faster. And it gave us entirely new possibilities, I think. It gave us, it gave us possibility to grow, to feed more people, to spend more time on other things than hunting and gathering. And actually, uh, because we then had time, we, had, we became creative, or we actually used our creativity to speed up the construction of culture and, uh, and society. Uh, powered by technology, industrial revolutions took place. The first uh, industrial re revolution made us from hunter-gatherers to the farmers that we became. Then the second industrial revolution gave us engines and the third industrial, re re industrial revolution which, in which we are now actually, it's the information age. Um, and that's also accompanied by a lot of uh, changes and it still causes a lot of changes. All revolutions actually were caused by technology or at least influenced or sped up by it. Uh, we are uh, now in an era where we can where we can't distance ourselves anymore from, uh, from technology. We are surrounded by it. Uh, we use the internet via data connections and devices, and de devices are created that communicate with each other. Uh, that's called the Internet of Things. And it's all supposed to make our lives more easy. As said, we are surrounded by technology. Technology is entering even our bodies. Uh, with the development, for instance, of nanotechnology, Nanomachines are actually in, in, included in our veins and brain technology helps us uh, uh, to concentrate and uh, it also helps paralyzed people to, uh, to steady their grip. And don't think really this is science fiction or something. I mean we, we as a group uh, two years ago we started to hack brains uh, with ordinary uh, equipment for less than hundred dollars. We can now hack a brain from Amsterdam in, in Montreal. And hack a brain means that we can scan something or put something in it. And you might find that pretty awkward, but it can do it. Uh, technology is now at a point where a computer can be any world champion of chess. And since recently, even any Go player. Uh, and a, a, a computer can ma make recipes and meals that are more creative and more likable than any star chef can make it. A computer program can already beat the Turing test, the standard test of testing intelligence. So convincing a human being in a 30 minute talk that it's human. Uh, technology can de detect flu before it breaks out. It uh, can make it pos possible, it made it possible to unravel all genes in the human, ge human genome. And technology can, can connect a brain in one continent to make a brain in another continent do something. Um, so this actually, all this technology can create medicine, it can cure diseases, it can make someone's brain, uh, brain's capacities more suitable for another person. Sorry. So in my definition, technology is all about believing in makeability. What we can make and uh, how we can make it. 
Technology is now is about making tools and building machines. It's a science of structuring, organizing and balancing raw material into means to an end. It's not about only physical material, it's also about mental material. It's the same as attaching a piece of iron to a wooden stick to make a hammer. We can organize culture, we can design social structures and we can engineer nature. Technology is all about having the ability of making models and simplifying reality in order to be able to construct and build upon it. In that sense, language is even technology, for it's a structure, it's an order, and it's balancing sounds in order to make a mental model to communicate. So we are, as Jos de Mull points it out, for instance, artificial by nature. Technology is really what makes us human. It's our ability to be, to reflect on being, and to reflect on reflecting itself. It's making models. It's all about making models in this world in order to structure, organize and balance raw materials, like mental materials, into means to an end. We create, therefore we are. We create our world, our rationale, our language, and we, and we even decide on what's created. In all ages, people said that there were areas that were human only and cannot be done by machines or technology. And almost all these preconceptions were, are already proven to be wrong. Technology or machines or computers can do everything we can think of. And my advice is now that we think positive and use it wisely. So what, what did technology do for us? Well, I have to question that question. First question being, is technology singular? Um, doing that would associate something like oncology with Bhopal, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Don't we have numerous competing paradigms of technology in any given time space? And furthermore, does technology really have an agency on its own or is it something a little bit more complicated? I think, and this is something probably a little bit diverging from where you're going, each technology is part of a greater network of institutions. It can't be apolitical and it cannot be singular. So I would rephrase the question... Thank you. I would rephrase the question as how people organize different technologies in society. And I will agree with you that we organize our technologies in our own image. If you go one more. Um, it was indeed human ingenuity and need, hunger, that brought about the agricultural revolution. But every society applied different techniques and it took centuries before it took hold. So if these cultivation techniques have changed our social organization in different ways, it was done in a very different way, in a very diverse fashion in different societies. The common pattern, the reason why we call the agricultural revolution a revolution was not because of its speed or its uniformity. It was because a pattern was emerging, a cyclical production relationship with nature that emerged and has become dominant in various societies. The industrial revolution was much faster and its effects were even more diverse for different societies. After all, it was a direct result of colonization, of other realities, of lands, of products, and, it, and the enslavement of other people's lives, bodies, and dreams. Let's also remember that both of these revolutions have significantly altered the balance of atmospheric gases. So it wasn't only people that they were affecting. So if technology is human, as you suggest, Martin, and I agree, isn't it also plural and diverse as all human things are? Is it not also equally and undeniably historical? And this is important because, unlike many other technologies, the dominant techno-scientific paradigm evades accountability by employing that we're all, uh, the idea that we're all party to it. And most of us do take part in it. We're consumers to its promise, to its bounty, to its speed. And we're party to the institutions that market its logic. But do we have an option, really? Can we choose to be healers without a medical degree? Can we be businesswomen without a so-called smartphone? 
can we as citizen, sta citizens stay outside of the neoliberal economy and not use any banking tech? The answers to all these questions are negative because technologies are part of a bigger package that makes these gadgets, institutions, ideas compulsory. So we are not really equal parties to techno scientific development. The dominant technological paradigm evades accountability by keeping its white male Western capitalist origin anonymous. To conclude this point and to suggest another, I will borrow two statements from two great philosophers. First, I want to recall Hannah Arendt's observation that to blame everyone is to blame no one. It's critical to keep the developers and employers of technologies accountable and every action that we do as individuals too. Otherwise, we can simply argue that technology comes with risks. Disasters happen. And no one could have predicted the results, really, as they did with Chernobyl. Thank you. And secondly, I would like to recall um, Donna Haraway's concept of nature cultures. And I think this is a good point to introduce to our dialogue. Since her early work on the Cyborg Manifesto, Haraway highlights that nature, techne, humans have always already been interrelational. But perhaps more importantly and smartly, she enlists bodies, machines, illnesses, technologies, and identities into our individual and communal selves. Hmm. Questions? Well, I heard a few questions, and uh, first of all, yes to one of them. Uh, yes, technology has caused a lot of ba bad side effects, and Alfred Nobel uh, positioned that best when he, when he uh, when he founded the Nobel Prize Foundation, uh, he felt bad and responsible, responsible for all the dynamite he put upon the earth and mankind. And but to suggest technology is bad is the same as mathematics or knowledge is bad. So technology is as bad as the humans who use it, deploy it, or sell it. And how bad the people that do that. I want to continue to look in what to, uh, technology can do in the future, in my view. But first, also to react to another question you had about the plural thing. Yes, yeah, I, yes, too. I think I tend to agree. Also, hmm. Shit. technology is or can be viewed as a plural thing, as diverse, diverse as all human things um, and human beings. Sorry, uh, technologists. Um, technology is handled differently, but by different societies and cultures, leading to different tools and uh, also different models and also different humans uh, tend to construct and handle different technologies and tools for their purpose in different ways. Yeah, I do think that it's plural, but the thing is that I think that human individuals and culture do not only propel technology, making it plural, make, making it plural really in, at its core. I think technology seems to be more or less self-propelled also. Um, and it uses us as humans to evolve. Um, this idea is actually the same as, well, the hero that was, that was named earlier by you and you even, because Bohm's idea on dialogue was actually that dialogue uses humans to evolve and spread, as if it were an agent of its own. Hmm. Well, technological innovations, actually, I had an, another idea, uh, like stories and ideas, seem to come in different societies, even unrelated societies, in roughly the same epoch uh, during human history. So, in some way, uh, by different standards, maybe by chance, they, they just existed in different places unrelated. And that's actually the same as in evolution, by the way. Because in the evolution, similar organs were actually, have evolved in different, even unrelated continents. And how did that happen? I mean, was there some great architect somewhere? Or was it just chance? Or, or can we just view evolution and technology both, uh, both as singular as well as plural? So, the same at the same time. Or uh, seeing things as singular as plural is not really strange actually. A human is seen as singular, my, me, for instance. Uh, but we are just uh, a collection of cells, I think. And a cell is just a collection of molecules. 
So can humanity be just a collection of humans, being plural as well as singular? In just the same way, technology could be seen as singular as plural, I think. And maybe that's just our problem. I mean, that we see anything either as singular or plural. Maybe both happen at the same time. And me as a geek, I can also say that it's not so binary anymore. It's just that it has all the ingredients gradients in between, so it's just more analog. But uh, what can what can technology in the, in the future? I, I want to take a short look at that, if, if, if it's okay. Um, technology will be able to do things we cannot and will not understand. And the time when computers and technology can do things, cognitive things, things about thinking for instance, that humanity cannot understand, it's called singularity. And some experts claim that that will be in 2030. So in 14 years time. Um, I don't know how they calculated it, but they did. Mm -hmm. And what will happen when we know for sure and can prove that technologies like, for instance, AI, artificial intelligence, gives us answers, predictions and solutions that we do not understand? Will we then follow its advice the same way we use our TomTom in our car? Will we do that? And or it will will it be more like, for instance, the the computer Deep Blue, when he responded forty two to the question about life, the universe, is everything in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and actually the humans did not understand it and built an even greater compu computer to try to unravel the question to this answer. Challenge accepted. You're going quantum on me. <laughs> so I'm curious actually whether it worries you as a tech developer not to understand the question. Because for me this is already happening. I already feel excluded from the question. For instance, did anyone understand how and why Google changes privacy rules last month? Or did you just click it away? <laughs> I actually made the effort because we were preparing for this talk to read the small script and I still don't understand <laughs> and that is really not a surprising thing for me I guess most of us just clicked it away and this is a problem because how can we make wiser choices how can we keep public and private decision makers on technology accountable if you don't, don't even understand the question we should even be able to question the question. That would be proper democracy. And I agree with you that the Hitchhiker's Guide is a magnificent satire. So I will use this opening scene, actually, to illustrate this point, if you just click the next button. Uh, the book starts out with our protagonist waking up one morning, finding out that his house is going to be demolished. Some of you must have seen it. <coughs> Um, he heard it or read it for that matter. In fact, the whole planet Earth is going to be demolished. And the reason is that it's on the, in, in the way for a galactic highway. Humans at this point do not know that there's, they're aliens. So let alone understanding the question they, or provide an alternative, they, they just do not know how to deal with the situation. And I, and I think that's how technology is kind of cornering us into a certain political subjectivity today. And a metaphor works because it, it critiques developmentalism, it mocks it rather than critiquing it, and can be further extrapolated to neocolonialism today, forcing rationalist, techno-science and other institutions upon non-Western societies, for their own good of course. So we already seem to agree that Technology is not monolithic, not linear, and I would like to push it a little further. I argue that it is a set of institutions and discourses that make up networks of meaning and conditions in which we live in. This way we can accommodate your suggestion to understand technological artifacts, as well as human bodies and even thought as assemblages. Deleuze uses this concept to highlight that there is no fixed and stable ontology for the social world that proceeds from atoms to molecules to materials, as you suggested. And it doesn't think of parts and holes. It's more like a mosaic, a patchwork of sorts. 
capable of heterogeneity, mm. fluidity, and most importantly, perhaps, being transitory. One more. Second. Here's a suggestion. You don't have to read all of that. It's just a lot of text. <laughs> uh, but if different technologies belong with different assemblages of institutions, perhaps we can also find certain characteristics to categorize them. Some networks can be emancipatory, for instance, allowing us to appropriate them whichever way we like. Uh, take peer-to-peer -peer development of software, for instance. You can use it freely, change and contribute to it according to your needs, but you cannot buy or sell the product. So it is a completely new approach to intellectual property, law, social organizations, but also to innovation, what exactly you're doing. So this is possible, but also is a very manipulative way of organizing technology, turning users into consumers, customers, and dependent on the producers that produce the tech. So this table is something I concocted when I was investigating technology transfer that is endorsed by the United Nations in the name of sustainable development, of course. Some of these projects aimed to privatize public services or to teach the poor how to be better customers for their tech, and others considered the recipient communities as equals and respected their spontaneity, their dignity, and allowed for a convivial use of their technologies. So I put here as a suggestion to differentiate the manipulative from the convivial, so to speak, to see whether we can remain autonomous communities that have the knowledge and the capacity to understand, appropriate, and maintain these new assemblages. Empowerment. Well, I like, I like the word assemblages. Um, <laughs> I like the idea of technology of not being a monolithic or uh, linear process, but rather as a as an assemblage, uh, capable of heterog heterogeneity. Well, I, I like the words too, by the way. Fluidity and being transitory. Like any network, the power of an organization is in the dynamics. A supercomputer can be made out of ordinary computers. The internet is more than just computer programs, and especially when taking into account the people who use it or are on it. Altogether, it is something, it's indeed something more than the sum of its parts. Um, the whole can behave in a, in, in a beautiful fashion, like a flock of sparrows in the sky, like here. Uh, and it's actually governed, by the way, uh, here is the geek in me again, by three simple rules. Uh, there's a start vector of a sparrow, speed and direction, and the sparrow will try to fly to the center of the flock, always, and it always will try to keep the same distance to another neighbor. It's actually, somebody modeled that, and it was really cool, because it had the same dancing ability of this flock of, flock of sparrows. And it was, the one who did that was Theo Janssen, who used a computer, and a computer program, by the way, to simulate evolution, to try to achieve the best possible, yeah, synthetic sparrow. Um, and also he used, used the same computer to make the strong based that thing. And that's, uh, that's just pipes, electricity pipes, and he constructed the thing that works on wind where all these legs were so so well developed by this evolutionary computer program. That was cool. It's really it's really a system, it's it's an assemblage, I, I, in my in my view. And like a network, like technology is is, is really it's it's just like social structures actually. It connects us more and more with each other, we, we as individual human beings become more and more interrelated. We become a network that's merged actually with technology. This connected being is becoming more and more powerful. And uh, I agree with you again here, uh, it's becoming more and more dangerous. Uh, we as connected and organized beings will become more and more thin synthetic. Not only as ind individuals, like Jos de Mul for instance says, um, but also as a collective. Knowledge will spread faster than ever. Ideas do too, and technology will do too. And all these will come sooner or later to to become to evolve themselves even. And most science fiction movies, they they will depict this in, as a in a simple Hollywood black and white movie. So, for instance, uh, scenarios like in Ma in the Matrix, um, in which technology harvests our energy for their own use, 
or maybe even Star Trek. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but there was a species in Star Trek called the Borg, and uh, they they were they were they would organize themselves without individualism, like ants. Um, but we are not the Borg. We are humans, and we might be a network. I might I might like technology, but we are humans, and we just like many other species, animal species, have constructed social structures to keep us from individual drifts and frenzies. And social structures have actually evolved as a powerful mode of survival. I'm not kidding myself actually that I am a more moral being out of, out of choice. I'm just, I have moral tendencies because that has evolved in all humans. Uh, just like the ability to create technology. And like sparrows, I think, and networks and stone based so too, too uh, I think, we can view societies and communities, cultures and ideologies. They are stacked systems that organize in a dynamic fashion, making it more powerful than its parts. In a dynamic system, communities are not in need to be autonomous. Um, they are interwoven in these systems. They all interrelate. And I would rather like to ask how we as individuals can rule out damaging conduct by technology or just by other human beings. I believe that it's, uh, it, um, that is what social or moral codes are for. They are born into man in the same way, I think, as technology is. It's not the only technology that makes us human. It is also our social uh, capabilities. In, uh, that, that results in law and ethics and morality and activism even. I think we could use our deepest intuition and be empathic to the collective behavior to differentiate the, manip the manipulative from the, from the convival, like in, this, in, the, in the picture that you stated. Just by focusing actually on the process, not on good or bad, not our means or results. So let's try to disagree a little. <laughs> um, in 2008, it was proposed to the Geological Society of London that we should name our new geological time scale. They suggested it should be called the Anthropocene. Now that our species, humankind as a whole, and historically as a whole, influences the planet to such an extent that we have a dent in that geological timeline that looks quite long. Really. I mean, the last time we changed the name was the last time we decided to give a name to a time scale was a hundred thousand years ago. So, two different interpretations of the Anthropocene has emerged immediately. You know, our scientists, we love writing about things. So, the first were obviously the, the quickest one was to suggest that we can and should intervene in the um, in the great, increasingly greater greater scales to planetary ecosystems. Geoengineering ideas like putting CO2 in the ocean bed or putting mirrors in the space to reflect um, uh, sunshine were introduced as legitimate technologies to combat climate change. There is no mention of democracy, autonomy, self-determination, pluralism in this narrative at all. The best case scenario, it imagines the world to be ruled by an elite of well-meaning engineers and scientists. <laughs> and just like the board, who accept the hierarchy in their organization without any questions whatsoever, we are expected to organize ourselves in this fashion. But Against this narrative, and to my happy surprise, a couple of scientists, hopefully including myself, we would like to argue that we should reveal the historicity <coughs> of such elitism and the discrimination involved in the problematic utopias of geoengineering. So, I belong with the second narrative, and the proposal we suggest reveals a very powerful ontological shift. We can no longer assume that nature and society are separate, nor should natural so and social sciences be separate. In this approach, techno-science is interrelated with other social institutions like education, like democracy and capitalism. And here is how I interpret it. First, the Hegelian idea that 
individual humans can do whatever they want, history will take care of it. Everything in the end will go towards a reasonable mean is no longer valid. With globalization, more people use the same gadgets, we, use, we see the same images, we respond in exactly the same way to these stimuli and to, to being in the same situation. So when we all order something from Amazon, because nobody, nobody has time anymore to shop really, the paper consumption skyrockets globally. And it's not for the books, it's for the packaging. And that makes me want to cry. And the more important part is that the impact of human behavior on the planetary systems is, gets intensified, whereas the legitimacy of individual behavior or the accountability of social institutions is not so quickly reconsidered. So our social systems do not necessarily support us in dealing with this fast-changing technological change. Um, and the second point is that this is the end of nature as an object. And I would like to congratulate that natural scientists and engineers are catching up with um, social science. Modernist hegemonic projects relegate nature to a realm of transcendence. It is there to be discovered and to be acted upon. It's an object. It has no agency. And as modernity has systematically refused to consider the rights of the object, from the laboratory animals to the genocide, this has become a very meaningful interpretation of how modernity has transformed our societies, as Bruno Latour reminds us. So in order to give back nature its position as an octant, as an agent, we have to be one with nature. But this is not so difficult, because we were always already been in all sorts of relationships with nature cultures. Nature then no longer refers to environment around you as the center, but rather it subsumes physical bodies, tech, things, non-mediated non and non-material relationships with everything around us. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the discourse coalition that allows this, this organization model, this organization of a paradigm uh, to take place in our societies, also gives it political agency. It allows for nature to be a political subject because it responds to very conservative policies that restrict abortion rights or call environmentalist terrorists. Well. Of course, by the way, we live in the Anthropocene because we have invented the definition. And uh, we invented the definition of stating that this is the epoch that begins when human activity started to have a significant, significant global impact on the earth, geology and ecosystems. And we do. But is that good for us? I mean, not. it's not good for us when we see that our in impact is bad. Uh, the funny thing is that we think it's bad for geology and ecosystems, but it's, it's even worse for us ourselves. Because uh, what will happen in the post-Anthropocene? Um, if we will use our Anthropocene impact, using technology uh, for good, we will be more in balance with ourselves as individuals, with, uh, as a collective, and even with nature. Uh, deep ecology at its best. And the only way we can get there, if we do not keep the eye at the ball, but at the process, uh, the different truth, being, at, being and events. So if we will not use our capabilities for good, we will be gone. That's easy. And nature will actually rebalance itself. And it has a new starting point. Or will technology be there still after we are gone? That's strange because it's our mirror reflection. Hmm. Kevin Kelly, by the way, thinks so. He thinks that technology is our successor. I don't believe. I don't believe, actually, in fatalistic scenarios. I'm an optimist. I believe that we are neither good nor bad, and so is our self-image. Uh, so technology is not good or bad either. I believe that even while it might be pointless, I want to focus on being as much me as well as us. 
and I want to be a moral, I mean, as a, as a moral individual, I want to be as good as I can. Um, and I also want to be and feel us at the same time as a species, connected with nature. And I hope actually that technology will give us the possibility or might help us to do that. And that I can be me and us uh, at the same time. And that it might make me a more collective sentient being than ever before. I hope that, that I can be me and us. Technology and thinking about technology like this is making me think more about what it is to be human. And technology as our collective self-image really works for me individually. The reflection does not only show the technology in it, it shows also you yourself and what is special about it. So, actually, I see characteristics in me and in relation with technology. I see about developing these as aspects like creativity and compassion, etc., and try to focus on that. I see aspects of me that I cannot grasp to be synthesized, while I know that it must happen once. But while doing this, I also focus on what, what it is that makes me, to the deepest of myself, being human. And I actually, I actually even can, can, can see more in between my rational thoughts, and in the spaces between that. And while doing that, I tend to quite enough disappear, I merge with my mirror reflection. And, and in this process, I think I'm growing. And we, as humans, uh, cannot help, by the way, to, to, to think, to put ourselves in the middle of everything. Also in the center of Anthropocene. I mean, so did we do that? Uh, uh, um, in, yeah, I'm, I mean, even, even by, th by saying that, if, if we are in the Anthropocene now, and some of, some of the people say, after this there will be the Technocene, if it's, our rear, if it's our mirror, then that's the Anthropocene too. It's just, just the Droste effect all over again. It's, it's repeating itself. So, um, we have put ourselves always in the middle of everything. Uh, before Galileo, we were in the middle of the universe. Before Darwin, we were in the middle of time. And I think now, it's time to, to remove ourselves from the middle of perspectives. A more integral view to the whole, as well as the integral parts and their interrelations. I think that is needed. And we need to push the human individual and the individual perspective out of the center of all perspectives. But can we do that as individuals? I think we can. I think we can do that by embracing technology as part of us, by embracing ourselves as well as the nature that connects us. So how can I get out of this without turning into a tree hugger? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think we can too. And I think we don't even have to totally dislocate the individual. Perhaps through empathy and dialogue we can, we can do what exactly deep ecology, land ethics, ecofeminism have all suggested. That we are part of a bigger whole on which our actions might have potentially damaging effects. We can solve this problem by transcending our ego so says deep ecology, an individual self by empathizing with the greater self, the self with a capital S. And that includes a greater number of members of this nature culture that we might be belonging to. And this involves a different kind of technological assemblage that is more diverse, more pluralist, and also a different kind of nature that is more poetic and metaphorical and even linguistic. And this is an image that, that we're both drawn to, uh, I know from our discussions. It is not sufficient to collapse the human nature dichotomy. We must also allow for a contradictory and coexistent imageries of multiple Anthropocene features. And hopefully they can create hegemonic projects which can be contested and competing democratically. But all of this requires a deeply founded moral political pluralism. And are we ready for that? Seems to be the question. It also requires us to go beyond borders and categories we feel good about, which is a task much easier to accomplish in community than individually. So I suggest we embrace the myth of the Tower of Babel. The story goes, when humans built a tower to reach the heavens, God strikes them and confuses their tongues. No one can understand each other. So all sorts of wars and strifes begin. 
But perhaps that division is simply diversity, is the human condition. And through dialogue we can appreciate it rather than overcome all conflict, whether it be human, technique or natural. Thank you.